in part two of the lecture on explaining motion, I'm going to discuss Newton's laws for forces. I will explain how forces affect the motion of objects. Let's first start with the definition of a net force. Imagine you have an object, for example, a wooden box that is um, placed on a flat horizontal surface. And so this box is under the action of several forces. Let's say two forces. We have one force, let's call it F1, that's pulling horizontally to the right. And let's say another force, F2, that is pulling vertically up. So because this box is under the action of those two forces, this box is going to move in a certain manner. Well, if I replaced those two forces with a force that is equal to the sum of those two, added as vector quantities, then the box is going to move exactly the same way. And so this single force that I'm using to replace forces F1 and F2, that is equal to the sum of F1 and F2, is known as the net force. And so if I were to sketch this, that will look something like this. So the net force is equal to the sum of F1 and F2. Of course, this is a two-dimensional example, and um, finding the net force <coughs> in two-dimensional cases is beyond the scope of the course. So I'm going to use a one-dimensional example for calculation of net force, and we are going to use um, coordinate system and positive and negative orientation to be able to calculate the result. But first, let's write down the definition of a net force. An object under the action of several forces moves the same way as if it were under the action of one single or net force, which is equal to the sum of all forces acting on the object. So let's illustrate this definition with an example. The object below is under the action of a 5 Newton and 10 Newton force as shown. Find the net force acting on the object. So the 10 Newton force is trying to move the object to the right and the 5 Newton force is trying to move the object to the left. So to calculate the net force, I must decide um, which direction of motion here is positive and which is negative. So the standard um, accepted definition for positive direction would be positive is to the right and negative is to the left. So any um, force vector that points in positive direction when finding the net force in the sum, I'm going to take with the positive sign and any force vector that points in negative direction, when I'm calculating the sum, I'm going to take the value with the negative sign. And so then the net force will be equal to 10 newtons. And I'm selecting this with a positive sign because it points in positive direction, minus 5 newtons, which is uh, selected with a negative sign here because it points in negative direction. And so then the result of this is 5 newtons. So the net force is 5 newtons in positive direction. So that means that if I consider this same object and I only apply 5 newtons of force in positive direction, this object will move exactly the same way as the object under the action of those two forces. That is the meaning of net force. So, for those types of problems and any other type of problem with a vector with addition of vector quantities, you must define a reference frame 
or a map, if you will, in which you are defining positive and negative orientation. And then when you are calculating the net vector, in this case net force, all the forces that point in positive direction in the calculation you take with positive sign, all the forces that point in negative direction in the calculation you take with negative sign, and then you just perform the sum. And then the result will be either positive or negative or zero. If the sum is positive, then that means that the net force points in positive direction. If the sum was negative, that means that the net force points in negative direction. And if the sum is equal to zero, that means that there is no net force acting on the object. So now let's look at Newton's laws of motion and how they are defining how forces act on objects. So let's state Newton's first law. It is also known as the law of inertia. Newton's first law states that the velocity of an object remains constant unless a non-zero net force acts on the object. A second part of the statement is that an object at rest remains at rest unless a non-zero net force acts on it. So let's discuss the two parts of this statement separately. The velocity of an object remains constant unless an unbalanced net force acts on the object. The meaning of this is um, the following. Velocity is a vector quantity. It has magnitude and direction. As long as the velocity does not change in magnitude and in direction, it remains constant. Imagine an object that is moving with constant velocity. For example, a hockey puck on an ice surface. So the hockey puck is moving with constant velocity and it will never change the direction in which it's moving and it will never also speed up or slow down unless a non-zero net force acts on this hockey puck. Once a non-zero net force is applied to this hockey puck, it will either change direction of motion and or the speed with which it's moving. So its velocity will change. But if non-zero net, if, if the net force that's uh, acting on this puck is equal to zero, meaning there is no net force acting on this hockey puck, then it will not change the way it's moving. There is no reason for that. So the most important part of the statement is that constant velocity of motion equals to no net force acting on the object. So one more time, when the velocity of motion is constant, that means that the net force that's acting on, that's acting on this object is equal to zero. There is no net force. Now let's look at the second part of the statement of the first law. An object at rest remains at rest unless a non-zero net force acts on it. This statement is more intuitive, and we know that from everyday experience. If an object is at rest, it will never move on its own unless an external or non-zero net force is applied to this object. Imagine your cell phone is, lay, is uh, resting on the, on the table next to you, and unless you pick it up, it will not move there from there on its own. So you are applying a non-zero net force, which results in your cell phone moving. Another important aspect of the first law and how force affects the motion of objects is the relationship between the net force and the mass. More specifically, the, iner the inertia of an object and the resistance to the change in the state of motion. So we know that if an object is in motion, and this object is very light, from everyday experiences and from general intuition, we know that it's going to take a small amount of force to change the way the object moves. Change the direction of motion, slow the object down, speed the object up, or stop the object from moving. And so we know that objects with small mass 
are um, examples of that type of behavior. However, we also know that objects with large mass are, have a different type of behavior. It is much harder to make those objects move, to stop them if they're already in motion, to change the direction in which they're moving, speed up or slow down their motion. And a simple example of light versus heavy object and how they move uh, based on the net force applied to them is an empty shopping cart and a loaded shopping cart. You know from experience that an empty shopping cart is very easy to manipulate. It's easy to push, pull, make turns with it. But once you load it with heavy items, it becomes much harder to push, pull and make turns with it. And all of this difference in behavior is simply because the mass of the shopping cart is different. So basically the shopping cart has different resistance to a change in its motion based on the mass of it. The heavier the cart, the harder it is to change the way it moves. The lighter the cart, the easier it is to change the way it moves. And so the first law is also associated with the inertia of objects. Inertia is a quality that is related to the mass of an object. We cannot measure inertia. However, as I already explained, if we can measure the mass of an object, we can then um, estimate um, how easy it will be to make this object move in a certain way. So there is a relationship between mass and inertia. And that relationship is purely um, qualitative. Larger mass means larger inertia, means the object will be harder to move in a particular way. Smaller mass means smaller inertia, which means that the object will be easier to move in a particular way. And mass we can measure, because that's one of the fundamental quantities in nature. And so to summarize, large mass equals large inertia, which means that large net force is required to change the way an object moves. And <clears throat> small mass equals small inertia, which then means that smaller net force is required to change the way an object moves. Now, I mentioned, as I was explaining mass and inertia, I mentioned the, that larger mass requires um, larger net force to make the object move in a particular way. So now let's look at the relationship between net force and mass and how that specifically affects the motion of objects. This relationship is stated in Newton's second law. Newton's second law is also known as the law of acceleration and it is the law that gives us the relationship between force, mass and acceleration. Newton's second law states that the net force F on an object is equal to the product of the object's mass M and acceleration A. Written in a formula form, Newton's second law looks like this. The net force F is equal to the product of the object's mass M and acceleration A. As you can see here, depending on how the mass changes, if the force is kept constant, that will determine the acceleration of motion of the object. If the force is kept constant and the mass increases, then the acceleration must be decreasing. And if the mass is uh, decreasing, as the force is kept constant, then the acceleration must be increasing. This is intuitively obvious from, again, everyday experiences. Back to the example with the shopping cart. An empty shopping cart has small mass and you know, suppose you are pushing on it with a constant force. That means that this shopping cart will be moving with larger acceleration. It's going to be moving faster by applying the same force. Now, when you load the shopping cart with heavy items, the mass goes up. The force that you are applying on the shopping cart is the same. 
the acceleration is smaller. The cart is moving slower than before. So, when the mass of an object increases, large inertia, for the same applied force, the acceleration decreases. When the mass of the object decreases, small inertia, then for the same applied force, the acceleration will be increasing. So the second law also tells us something else. If a non-zero net force acts on an object, this object accelerates. There is no situation in which a non-zero net force acts on an object and this object is not accelerating. If there is non-zero net force, that means there is also acceleration. The second law also can be read in the opposite direction. If an object is accelerating, that means that it must be under the action of a non-zero net force. The, per the previous law that uh, we discussed, the first law, the first part of the statement of the first law was talking about constant velocity motion. And when I explained what that means, I said that when there is no acceleration, the velocity is constant. So in terms of the second law, when there is no acceleration, that means that there is no net force acting on the object. And the statement of the first law stated exactly that. In the absence of non-zero net force, the object doesn't change the way it moves. So only when non-zero net force is applied to an object, this object will change the way it moves. It will accelerate. So even though those are two different statements, they are somewhat related in the way that forces are explained how they act on objects. Now a little bit more about the units of force. So at the beginning, I stated that force is measured in units of newtons. But I also stated that newtons are a derived unit and they then must be a combination of base units. And so we can derive that combination of base units by looking at the formula of the second law. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. So we know that force is measured in newtons. But we also know that mass is measured in kilograms, that is the base unit. And then acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. And so newtons are the product of kilograms, the units for mass, meters, the units of length divided by seconds to the second power. So those are the units for time to the second power. So in terms of base units, the newton is kilogram times meter per second squared. So what does that mean for calculation purposes? It means that when you're calculating using the second law, mass must be converted into kilograms. If you do not convert the mass into kilograms, then the unit that you're going to get for the answer will not be newtons, and therefore the answer will be wrong. So always convert the mass unit to kilograms when you're calculating forces. Let's summarize the second law. An object under the action of a net force F will always move with some acceleration A. And the opposite is also true. An object which is moving with some acceleration A must be under the action of a net force F. And furthermore, if the force is kept constant, when the mass is large, the acceleration is small. When the mass is small, the acceleration is big. So they are inversely proportional. Let's do an example calculation using the second law to illustrate how the formula is applied. A car with mass of 1200 kilograms is under the action of a 2000 Newton force. What is the acceleration of the car? 
So I know that the force acting on the car is 2000 newtons and I also know that the mass of the car is 1200 kilograms. What I'm looking for is the acceleration. So I have those three quantities linked together in this problem. That is a um, problem about Newton's second law. So therefore I must use the statement that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. Since I want to calculate the acceleration from here, I will rearrange the terms to solve for the acceleration. The acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Now I'm ready to substitute the known quantities in this formula and calculate the result. So this will be equal to 2000 newtons divided by 1200 kilograms. Let's show um, how the units here will calculate to give the correct units for the answer. So this will be 2000 and newtons are kilograms meters per second squared divided by 1200 kilograms. The units of kilograms cancel out and then what we are left with is 2000 meters per second squared divided by 1200. And so this is equal to 1.67 meters per second squared. And that is the acceleration with which this car is moving.